Hi, I'm Jay, and welcome to the newest podcast on YouTube called Cheeks Happy Nostalgia Show, where I interview people involved with kids shows and more from our childhoods. We'll be sharing our favorite memories, talk behind the scene moments, and so much more. I'm your host, Jake Devonball, and welcome to this Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. I'm your host, Jake, and of course, I always say every single time, like the eighth time for this, I always want to say every single time. Our co-hosts, Chris Bixby, Matthew Johnson, and Wyatt McCullough. How are you three? We're good. 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 Very awesome. Especially what we have for our guest today. But before we get into, you know, introducing this, you know, the guest for this, I'm going to say this. I think probably three of you will agree with me on this. Um, a couple of weeks, like last couple ep- um, episodes we've done, like Dave Thompson and Brian Woodbury, that is amazing. Um, for you know, for for how much Brian like writes so much songs for Big and Big Blue House, and and Dave, you know, talked about his times, you know, being a comedian and his time as which you which know, performer as you know, as Take a Wiki. Um, so yeah. Um, it's really amazing for to get have those interviews like that for how much we grew up with and especially for the whole show that we experienced right now. That is amazing. So and and we appreciate so much for the support, which we appreciate a lot. Anyway, so um well last week we got a composer. Well, in this episode we, we can we are having a, another composer here. Um so the guest we're having is he is a Australian pianist. If you guys don't know what the heck it is, it's basically like piano musician, which is me, which that's what's it called for Australia. Um, he's also a composer. Um, and best known for him being a fifth wiggle for the Wiggles, which he, of course he's he was only only a wiggle for the debut album in 1991, which is also the Wiggles' 30th and first suite, and that's what the year started, which is just 1991, 30 years ago. And and here he is. And we, of course, we're going to talk about stuff, you know, of his composing, what he's done, and, and Wiggles, you know, where you name it. But anyways, can I want to pause to Philip Watcher. Philip, how are you? I'm doing really well. Hey, at the outset, can I just say that um, this year, especially with the 30th anniversary of the Debo album and the Wiggles beginnings, mm-hmm. uh, I think back in March for my birthday, I started receiving lots of messages of gratitude and, 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 and well-being from Wiggles fans who had grown up, you know, much like yourself and everybody. Um, and at the time, I had no idea why I was receiving these messages, and they were overwhelmingly beautiful messages. And um, then I realized that it was the 30th anniversary of, of the Wiggles beginnings in the Debo album. and. I am just so grateful to have been remembered by everybody with such kindness, and um, it has meant a lot. So thank you. Yeah, you're of very, course. You're very welcome. Um, mm-hmm. I'm so glad that so much of those fans just just know you in general, and it's really amazing for. But yeah, uh, but of course, no problem. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're doing well, especially what's been going on. We you know, of course, you know, COVID and everything. So, yeah, so I'm yeah. glad that you're still well. So. It's, I mean, it's a difficult time for the world over, I think, um, with COVID. Uh, but I think yeah. it's, a, it's a problem that has to be co- treated collectively, I think, rather than, than you know, uh, we all have to work together to get through this. Mm-hmm. Yep. Especially and we, will, we will get through it. Yeah, we will get through it, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. yep. yeah. Very true, which I know Australia is having a difficult time with, with it right now. So, but, you know, pray, for, you know, with the future. Mm-hmm. What was that? We're all in this together, is what I said. Yep. Yes. Of oh. Course. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yes. High school are. musical reference. Yep. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Of course. Mm-hmm. So, I'm going to start off with this question that that's very very cool for for starting off. So, how you start became that you want you know what to do you know like you know of course a PM pianist and composer and anything that and whatever you aspired for where you are and being today and how how that all happened and where you are now 
Oh, okay. That's going back to my childhood. Um, of course, I, I was eight years of age when I had my first piano lesson. Um, and how that came about, um, my father and mother, we had gone to a, an awards night for the local swimming carnival, which was held just down the road from where I live in, in a hall. And at this particular night, there were two pianists either side of the hall playing, um, playing the piano. And it fascinated me. Um, and from that moment on, I wanted to learn to play the piano. And my father, uh, I think much, much to my mother's surprise, bought bought a piano without even knowing if I would really take to it, um, bought a small upright piano for me. And, and I received my first lessons at eight, at eight years of age. And it wasn't in, probably until around about I was 12 or whatever that I, I, um, I wanted to have an original manuscript of a living composer, um, like a, a piece of music written in their own hand. And uh, I knew that there was a, a wonderful Australian composer named Miriam Hyde who lived nearby and she became my mentor. And um, she was the most extraordinarily generous and kind woman. And I wrote her and asked her if she would send me a, an original manuscript. And she sent me this, this manuscript in her own hand. I didn't know from a bar of soap, but you know, she, she, um, she, she, sent, she sent me a manuscript as a gift. And uh, from that moment on, I then thought I wanted to write music. And my earliest memory of, of wanting to write music was uh, being sprawled out on the lounge room floor with sheets of blank manuscript paper in front of me. And I had no idea how to notate music, but I, I made up fanciful titles for pieces of music that I'd hoped I would write one day and even designed covers for them like Dance of the Bat or Gladiator's Dance without really knowing how to write music. Um, and I just, you know, I just stuck at it. And the very first piece of music I wrote, I, I sent to Miriam Hyde. And she became my mentor really for over 30 years. So that's how I got into writing music. And um, I have been blessed throughout my life to have musicians far greater than myself take me under wing and, and train me and mentor me. And most of them have done it without seeking any reward for themselves. So when I try to mentor younger musicians now, uh, within my heart, I feel that I'm paying their legacy forward to younger people through me. Um, it, it's to pay the good deed forward. So that, that's how I got into writing music. And, and that's my, um, I suppose you'd say, my, uh, what I feel my purpose is in life, to, to um, express myself through music and through writing words, and to hopefully inspire other people to find them, their selves through that, you know. That, that's mm -hmm. how I got into it, yeah. Wow, that's, that's awesome. It's really awesome of what experience and in the joyful way you get for you know being what you want to do and for all this that that we do. And I'm glad that you're really blessed about what you're doing because because it's really important that if you're what you're doing, if you're blessed for doing it, then you, of course you want to keep going. That's what what happy of life. Yeah, I think I, mean, I, I think I think generally life itself is a blessing, I, even the hardships that you experience throughout life. Right. But the, the trick is to turn the hardship into your hardship and sail on through it, you know, no matter what right. you face, however difficult the problem. Nothing is ever sent to you that you cannot carry on your shoulders because it wouldn't have been sent to you in the first place. Any mm -hmm. difficulty that you face in life, for example, it's, it's there to show you that you've got the courage mm -hmm. to deal with it. And, and that's been my entire belief right throughout life, right throughout my life. So everything is a blessing, no matter what it is. It just depends on how you look at it. You know? Very true. Yeah. Very true indeed. Um, but yeah, that's really amazing what you've done for it. That that can be for what we've done. So I'm really pre so we really appreciate it and for what you've done. You know, they know you to the people who knows that that knows him, that you know that people knows you from being composer or, or um. A, uh, a musician, musician like pass and uh, and your YouTube and your YouTube channel too. So it's really awesome. thank you. But too. I'm going to say to you, I'm going to say to you and to Chris, and to Matthew and Wyatt, you're doing it yourselves now. You're doing it with with your work at YouTube, um, mm -hmm. because what you're doing in interviewing other people, not thinking of me right now, but in the people that you've interviewed in the past, mm -hmm. um, you're creating. You're, you're putting a spotlight on the legacy that they are they're going to leave and this is going to be your legacy so you are doing exactly the same thing you're giving of yourselves and that's a really beautiful thing that's right yeah. thank you so much thank we appreciate the words oh you're yeah. welcome also no problem by the way so you said thanks from what i said earlier um also what, is there anything you want to say Wyatt? 
Um, no, what, 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 I mean, uh, tell me, each of you, I mean, I, uh, I know you, okay. Jake. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Lon. How did the Wiggles come about? How did the Wiggles come about? Yeah, like, like, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of fans who are watching this interview are w wondering, like, how did you uh, get started in the Wiggles? Like, how, how did that uh, opportunity come about? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I was, um, this is going back, I think, to probably, it was 19, 1989. I, I was um, looking for part-time work. I had worked for the ABC in the early 80s. Nice. Uh, and then after working for the ABC, I took on a job as a pianist for, um, <laughs> for uh, believe it or not, a, a, a doctor. His name was Dr. Jeffrey Edelston, and he operated 24-hour medical centers, and they were very lavish kind of medical centers. And he employed me as his pianist to play in three medical centers. I, I treated it as being like music therapy, you know. Um, and when I left that job, uh, I was looking for a part-time job, which um, would allow me also to focus more on my work as a composer without, you know, um, impacting too much on, on, on my creativity. And um, uh, another musician friend of mine had told me that there was uh, a part-time job going at the Institute of Early Childhood um, for what was termed a music assistant. And um, the lecturer there in, in early childhood music was a, a wonderful lady by the name of Rosemary Howe. Um, and Rosemary was an inspired teacher. And she taught the Wiggles everything that they know. Um, right. In that I say she taught Anthony, Murray and Greg everything they know. Mm -hmm. And But Rosemary um, had some health concerns. She wasn't always terribly well. And the reason why um, she was seeking an assistant was because she needed someone to help her hold up, you know, the program that she was teaching and to support yeah. her. So I, I took that job. I, I got that job. And it was only a 17 hour a week uh, position for me. I was only working there at the Institute of Early Childhood for 17 hours. And it wasn't an entire year. My contract began at March and it finished in November every year. Um, and basically what I would do as Rosemary's assistant, I would prepare everything that she needed to teach the students. Uh, and when she was off for health concerns, when she wasn't, wasn't there on campus to teach, then I, 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 not that I would teach, but I would know what the students had to do and give them their work. So, um, and it was in 1990, I think, that I first met Anthony. Um, and... He used to, I, I suppose he more or less searched me out. Um, he would come to the music room office where I was of early of the morning. And um, uh, sometimes I'd hear him coming down, down the street where the campus was. And I'd, I'd hear him playing a tin whistle. And it was a bit like the Pied Piper. And I'd know that was Anthony coming. And he'd come up and, and we'd, we'd play music together and whatever. And it was towards the end of 1990 that he... Uh, said that he had this idea of, of, of doing a, a CD of children's music, pretty much mm -hmm. based on everything that he had learned from Rosemary um, and her curriculum. Um, and he asked me if I would be involved in it, and, and I said yes. And I, I, my memory is that I was the first person he asked, and then he went to ask Greg. And the reason why I think that is so is because in Greg's autobiography of 2011, I think he makes mention that Anthony had phoned him at his parents' home in December of 1990 to ask him if he would be interested. Well, I, Anthony asked me in November of that year, and he, since my contract finished it at the Institute of Early Childhood in November, then I, I was I, I, I remember being the first person that he asked, and that's how that came about, um, and it, it, it went from there. Um, and I think we recorded, I think we recorded the Debo album. Um, probably around February or March of 1991, I, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it was not long after that. We, we, we went into the studio and recorded everything that was, was done for it. So yeah, that's how, that's how I became involved. It was at Anthony's request. Wow, that's, that's, that's really, really cool. That's really amazing. That, that's awesome. So, 
Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that, like, also congrats for, like, you know, being on the placement of the, wherever they said about the, the teacher that, 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 um, by the way, that, um, that, that Anthony asked you, you know, be a part of it, which I know the, how the reason basically we will start was because of Anthony, because he was thinking about, you know, doing like a children's album. Well, we're going to still happen over like three years and still recording out children's albums for the group. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, and I know. I mean, as, that, as I said, I, had, I, as I, said I, I mean, I, I've not really thought about it in all these years. So that, as, as I said earlier, um, when people started mm -hmm. sending me birthday wishes this year, um, Wiggles fans, I had no idea why I was receiving these messages. And, um, you know, I mean, 30 years has passed in, in, in the bat of an eyelid. It's, it's passed by so quickly. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, you wouldn't have been born then, of course, you know. Right, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm sorry? Um, um, so, I know that where Greg Murray and, um, and Anthony, of course, that three of them were, were a part of the, a university called I'm not sure if I can pronounce correctly, but if I'm wrong, then of course correct me. But I think it's called mm. McGuire Mac University, or something that they are teaching, like you know, as a as a preschool teachers, and that's probably they're thinking probably they probably how that Anthony asked three of them, or two of them, I mean, for be a part of it, and which okay. <coughs> so let me get this straight: is that <coughs> of course. Anthony asked you to be a, for be a part of the project, and of course, because now since you both you since you and him were like kind of like music, musician like type of a way that that both of you met each other, and then you know, but then Anthony you know probably asked Greg and Murray since both of them were in the same university with with Anthony for you know for preschool teacher, yes. and then you know, and then for them you know, of course you and three of them are part of it, and I'm thinking Jeff how and Jeff wants to be part of it because you know. Because you know, because probably because the cockroaches, since since Anthony and Jeff was a part of it, so that's so that's so that's really awesome. So so um, I know you met Anthony because of, because of that reason, but what about for Greg, Jeff, and Murray? Because or you just saw them because <coughs> because of for the project, or is because that whatever. Oh, um, no, yeah, um, no, you're correct. It's Macquarie. Um, <clears throat> Um, but back then, uh, around about 1989, when I first went there to work mm -hmm. um, with the part-time job, it was known as the Institute of Early Childhood. It was a tertiary institute, but it wasn't a part of Macquarie University. And it wasn't until a, a year later, or maybe two years later, that it amalgamated with Macquarie University to be called that. Um, so, yeah, it was the Institute of Early Childhood in the early days. Um, and... I knew, of course, I already knew Anthony, and I knew Mari and Greg because there were students there as well. But um, Anthony mm -hmm. and Mari were third year students uh, when we did the Debo album. They're in their third year, and Greg was in his first year. So, um, as far as study goes, they were two years apart. Je Jeff wasn't a student then, he wasn't a student at the Institute of Early Childhood at all. Um, so, that, that's how I knew Mari and Greg, of course, because they were students as well. Mm -hmm. So, so you know Jeff since since he like he was a part of the project. I didn't really know Jeff all that well at all. Um, no. Jeff was brought in towards the end of the debut album being created and recorded. To oh. I believe the term is sequence everything that I had done, um, as far as arrangements and whatever goes. Um, so yeah, it was at the very end of of the album being recorded and created that. That Anthony brought Jeff in. I, I really didn't. I, I met Jeff probably a couple of times, but I, I didn't really know him. Ah, oh, that's cool. So, and so there was the film trip, of course. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm in the film trip with him. Um, yeah. But I, 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 I can't say that I really know Jeff as such. Oh. Not in the way that I knew Greg and 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 Murray and Anthony. Hmm. Hmm. So, so, so what happened is that. Um, so how all with the me with the five wiggles because Anthony probably wants to need like a fifth member. So probably that's why they asked 
he asked Jeff to be a part of it. And part of that's how probably the fifth wiggle thing became a became a thing. Well, and it, well, well, I'm thinking like Anthony wants like you to be the fifth wiggle since or something from because of reasons or something that why he wants you to be like a fifth wiggle position or something. But yeah, that's that's really interesting because. I know that Jeff wasn't really a part of, uh, wasn't singing or anything on the album that, if I, rem- that I remembered. But correct me, Chris, if just in case if, if he was a part of the album, okay, Jeff? Um, yeah, look, like the, not. The, yeah, yeah, I mean, the whole Fifth Wiggle thing was, I believe, a term that was coined in the press. Uh, it wasn't something that was created by the Wiggles as such or by Anthony, although perhaps indirectly. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a... a a, a title or a term that was applied to me more or less by the press. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that wasn't really a, a, a formal thing within the group. Um, Jeff, I think um, Jeff's recognized contributions to the Debo album as a whole came in at about 9.10%. And I think that percentage of work from him um, had to do with um, the music that was used for the debut album from previous cockroach songs like Dorothy the Dinosaur, which was um, the music from that comes from a cockroach song called Another Saturday Night. Um, And as well that um, his percentage, the 9.10%, I think it was, uh, every arrangement that I had done on on the Debra album was uh, divided up collectively among the group. So mm-hmm. um, everybody got, I think it was 0.2% of everything that I had done as well. So that that's what Jeff's percentage was made up of. Um, Jeff, I, I, I don't think Jeff contributed all that much to the creation of the Debra album as far as writing and playing yeah, since- and goes. Um, in real time, uh, much at all. I would say that 75% of the Debo album is my work and, and me playing on it. Um, but like where, for example, if I, I think from memory, if you look at the back of the Debo album, uh, where it has on any work traditional arranged by the Wiggles or even just arranged by the Wiggles, then those arrangements are mostly entirely mine and I'm, they're mostly played by me. On, on the keyboard with, with various sound effects. Um, but it's just that at the time, Anthony had explained to me that it was customary among groups and bands to attribute everything to the band as a collective um, and things to be divided up equally. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jeff, Jeff really didn't contribute that much to the creation of the Debo album. Yeah, since he wasn't really singing the song for the album, or, no, or, or no. just, for, just of course, just except with the music videos and the album cover and the picture that's right. and all. That's right. So it and he, as I said, Anthony brought him in towards the end of it all being recorded to to sequence. I think that's the term to sequence everything. Yeah. That I, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I know you have something thought of for for a while now, because you know, because of the Wiggles being like 30th anniversary or something. So I know your thoughts about for about the debut album, like should like remaster or slash or as the other word we release for the 30th anniversary. Like what are you, what was your thinking from from that? What was my thoughts about that? Mm-hmm. I I oh okay I I you, well what I did I mean I, I assume this is what you're referring to. Um, when I started receiving all the messages of goodwill from fans, especially around my birthday this year and, and whatever. Uh, for it being the 30th anniversary, and with COVID the way it is, I put to Anthony, um, I think I wrote him three times, the idea of perhaps re-releasing the Debo album, since, I mean, if if it's the 30th anniversary of of the Wiggles, then it is essentially the 30th anniversary of the Debo Mm -hmm. album. It is. Um, And and I put the idea to him in three letters um, of perhaps re-releasing the Debo album as a global fundraiser towards COVID, where all proceeds, all royalties and proceeds from sales would go to each country respective of their sales. So like if the USA would get whatever amount of money was made off it for COVID relief, as would Australia, the UK, Brazil, Germany, every country. So that it was a global fundraiser. But um, I, 
he he never replied to me so i don't i don't know um i mean i think it's a viable idea and i think it is something that that could at least if it wasn't um successful in raising funds towards COVID, it would at least be a gesture of goodwill and i think there's hope to be found in goodwill and and i would like to see it happen but um but anthony never actually seemed to respond to it to that idea yeah with and with COVID being you know really serious thing in australia again i think a fundraiser would definitely definitely help quite so. a bit yeah i think so i think i think it was back in march or around april that i wrote i, I wrote him three times yeah that, that um, sounds about right yeah yeah um but you know I, I still think it's a viable idea and and i don't want anything from it at all you know i would just like i, I thought it would be a good gesture um but anyway uh, that, that's that's how it is now so yeah but I'm I'm really it's glad about idea. that. It's yeah. a good idea for you to release it. It's kind of rude for Anthony not to respond. What was that? I couldn't quite hear you. It's a good idea for you to re-release it and Anthony not to respond yeah. back to you. We know he's busy. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah. I know as well that I think, I think some Wiggles fans had actually copied my letter from Facebook because I posted it on Facebook and sent it to him as well. Jeez. But I, I I don't know. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, he may yet still reply to it. Uh, he may yet still take up the idea and do it i think it's a i think it's a worthwhile idea a worthwhile idea um i really do but anyway um you know uh, but hopefully as i said I, I think we will all get through COVID anyway uh, we'll certainly learn to live with it if it's something that's going to be there all the time mm -hmm. it's just a matter of adjustment and, and I, I don't think that we should be uh too thwarted by it we, we will come through this mm -hmm. so it's very interesting that all of the actually like the, the debut album the like, shirts we like skivvy's shirts fashion shirts um but i know i think most likely there it's on like the wiggles like australian like a museum or something that that it was on the the um the um the museum which we know that now that anthony can actually still wear it but we but i know that most likely greg murray and jeff can't still wear anymore because of how because uh, what happened over the years that you can't they can't fit like those back then shirts you know mm -hmm. so that's real so but it's really amazing that he can still wear a shirt that's really amazing and so, i think I, I think i think i saw a photograph of it was it at instagram or? yeah it's, yeah. It's, it's, yes. yeah it's from the wiggles it was like anthony photos. wearing his uh shirt from that from the album Mm -hmm. yeah. he, he actually anthony actually chose the shirt that i wore the red one with the large white spots um wow. And because uh, I think it was in um, a lunch break one day or something, uh, he and I went down to the plaza at Bondi Junction, just near where the campus was, the Institute of Early Childhood. And we went into a shirt, shirt shop there. And there was the shirt that I wore, the, the red one with the big white spots. And there was another one there, which was black with the big white spots. And he, um, he chose that one. So he actually picked the shirt that I wore um that you see on the debut album cover yeah mm -hmm. that's really amazing and and i and i know what you've been like doing you know is really blessed for and same as for the og fans you know for what what they they received to you which i know it's really a blessing for us well um same as for you know working with with the debut album and here comes the song album a little bit which which i know that um but but overall, it's it's really amazing that what you've been like done after your weekly days. But but actually, I'm going to say this about this. There's because you know there's one song that you probably most of, mostly of OG fans like know about what of your creation of your song called Miss Chef the Monkey. How was uh -huh. how was for doing that song? Uh, I think like mischief is like my son. I don't know if if you can have a monkey as a son. <laughs> um, I have a real soft spot for mischief, um, and and actually, do, do you know Will Wagner and Tyler? Yes, Armstrong? yes, yeah. yeah I've, I've, I've more or less, I've more or less given mischief to them to to um to bring him up now, um, and and uh, it was um, earlier this year. Um, Will asked me if I would consider as part of the 30th anniversary year of, of, of the Wiggles of writing a a sequel type song. Uh, for Mr. the Monkey, uh, just the words. So I, I, I wrote, um, I wrote some lyrics for another, 
Mr. Song and, and Will and Tyler set about putting music to it. And I think that they've actually put a film clip up now on, on, on Will's channel. And um, they did a they did a fantastic job. They really did because yes, I, Will, I, I, Will, I, I, sorry. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say I, I actually um, when I wrote the lyrics to the second mischief song for Will and Tyler. Um, I wondered if they would actually be able to set it to music as well as they did, because it was a little bit tricky with some of the words. And I thought, hmm, you know, this might be a test for them. And I have to say that they passed with flying colours. They did a wonderful job of it, and um, I'm very grateful to them for, for what they have done. But Mischief, yeah, Mischief is... Um, uh, Mischief, I have a I have a soft spot for him. I have a friend in Spokane who who runs a late night radio show of, of punk music and, and whatever. Um, and he once played Mischief the Monkey <laughs> on his on his radio show um, wow. amid all the punk music that he plays. So yeah, uh, yeah, Mischief the Monkey is, is is quite a legend in my life. I think yeah. Very awesome. Yeah, yeah and you're right. Will and, song. Will and Tyler definitely did a very good on that. They're they're pretty good friends of ours too. Yeah, the, I, I've known Will. I've I've known Will for many years now. Um, Tyler more recently this year, um, mm -hmm. much like yourselves. Um, but I, I've I've known Will for quite some time. Um, but mischief, I, I I wrote mischief in about oh I I don't know I, I wrote it very quickly because like ten minutes, something like that, even less than that. Um, because we wow. were in the music room at the Institute of Early Childhood. Um, I think from memory there was yeah I think there was Anthony, Greg, and Murray. And um, we'd done most of of the tracks for the Debo album, mm -hmm. and Anthony used to call me Arch. He nicknamed me Arch because of my association with Liberace and the Liberace Liberace's family. Um, mm. And he just said to me, Arch, we need something else for for the Debo album. So I, I just got a large piece of paper and mm. sort of <laughs> laid down on the floor of the music room and and, and wrote mischief as. Um, and yeah, it happened very quickly. And it, I mean, it's not that it, it, it was clever of me to write it in such a short period of time, not at all, because it's, it's based on developmentally appropriate ideas for, for early childhood music. You know, it's, it's um, yeah, I, it, there's nothing, there's no wow factor there involved in the fact in, in that I did write it as quickly as I did, um, because it, it, it was geared towards early childhood um, you know, music and, and it's it's more or less a formula type thing. So, um, but yeah, I, I have a real soft spot for mischief. So, <laughs> yeah, so, he's a great so, little so, so yeah. you mentioned the nickname Arch. So there's a track on the yes. debut album called Archie's theme. Is that how? Uh, is that is yeah. that how that came um, about? Was from that nickname? Yeah, Archie's theme on the debut album. I actually is part of a piece that I wrote when I was 14 years of age. Oh, wow. Um, and the original piece was called Summer Dance, which you'll find on my YouTube channel. Um, and as I said, I wrote that at 14 years of age with another piece called Winter Reverie. They were like companion pieces. Um, and Summer Dance then later became Umbrella Dance when I, I used to play piano for a ballet school. And um, this ballet school that I used to play for did a ballet around it and, and with umbrellas. So then it became Umbrella Dance. And, uh, and then, of course, Archie's theme. And the idea on the Devo album the reason why it appears twice is because you've got, you've got Archie's theme and you've got um, the Halls of Montezuma, followed by Archie's theme again. Well, that bracket oh. of three pieces were for children in an early childhood setting to move to. So they would go from a skipping motion, say, for example, with Archie's theme, they would skip straight away into a march with Montezuma and then back to a skip. So the educational value of those three songs as one bracket had to do with children moving to music. Um, which is why Archie's Archie's theme appears twice. But yeah, Anthony had nicknamed me Archie because I had been to America to perform for the Liberace Foundation, um, a celebration for his birthday, and stayed in his home. So he nicknamed me Arch after Liberace, and it seemed to stick, yeah. My neighbor, actually, my neighbor just down from here has just bought a dog and she's called it Archie. Not that it's not that it's connected to, um, to that, but yeah. Uh, Yes, yeah, so that's how that's how Archie came about. It all, all to do with my time in America with the Liberace Foundation. Mm. That's very awesome. I know yeah. that the Skate V's from nine one was on a foundation at the moment, so it's very really amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, so. I, I have to say that um, if I could relive one time in my life over and over again without altering it forever, it would be my time um, with Liberace's family and friends because, I mean, he was a huge star. He was, he was a huge name in music, um, legendary figure, living legend, I suppose you could say. But um, when I went over there, I found his family and friends to be the most humble people you could imagine. And they treated me as if I was a special person. And they showed me a level of unconditional love that I'd never experienced from anybody before. And that came from his family, his sister, his housekeeper, Gladys. Um, his housekeeper, Gladys, she lived to be 100 years of age and she actually died on my birthday. And she was like a second mother to me. So my time, especially in Palm Springs, when I went to stay in his home, um, it's the most cherished time of my life. Um, and I think that as a child, when I used to watch Liberace on television performing, um, showmanship aside, and you know, like say the showmanship type of thing with Michael Jackson, showmanship aside, what wow. I was noticing about this man was that he was so full of love. And um, have you got time for me to tell you a long story about Liberace? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got time. Okay. okay. Well, I, you know, I, I guess as a child, he was what you would call um, my hero, and it was really, um, I, I guess he really inspired me to take up piano and, and, and to want to play the piano. Really, um, and my mother took me to see him uh, when he toured here in 1971, and he had not been here since the 50s. And his arrival to Australia in 1971 was, was huge. Uh, for about a month before his arrival, every day in the press, there was something about Liberace. Um, and when he touched down at Sydney Airport to start his tour, he received a reception like a dignitary, a world dignitary would say. Uh, and my mother, um, she took me to, to hear him play at the Capitol Theatre. Uh, in 1971, and I was hmm, 13 years of age. And um, he was um, classically trained as a pianist, but he then went more into the entertainment type of, of, of um, playing. Um, and that night, actually, at, at, at the concert, was a classical, classically trained pianist, a purist, named Romola Costantino. And she was reviewing his concert and the review she wrote of him was headed a genius and a jester, which sums him up pretty much. There was a genius at work in him and he was as much the jester. Um, and during that concert, there I sat at 13 years of age with this overwhelming feeling that one day my life would get closer to his. In some way, I would find myself, you know, and it wasn't until I joined, I joined his fan club as a boy. It cost $1 to join. And every three months you got a newsletter. Every Christmas you got the most elaborate Christmas card that he would send you. And it only cost a wow. dollar. And I remained a member of his fan club right throughout, um, right throughout until 1987 when he passed away. Mm. And during that time, I had actually um, taken up classical studies in piano, serious studies. And I, I didn't lose interest in him. I just didn't pay that much attention to him as a performer and a musician as I was when I was studying classical music more seriously. Um, and it wasn't until 1984 that he was touring Australia again. And I was working at the ABC at the time. And a girl that I was working with at the ABC, she came to me, she said I, that she would like to go and see Liberace. And then in 1984, he was playing the Sydney Hilton Hotel. And of course he was much older. I had not seen him, you know, I was 13 in 1971. So in 1984, I was however old I was, you know, as a young man. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, nah, I'm not really interested in, in going to hear him because my, it's not that my tastes in music had changed, but I, I, was, I was really steeped into 
you know, the black white, the, 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 the black tails, and, and that, that type of thing with classical pianists. Um, anyway, she convinced me to go. And we got, we, we got dressed up. Uh, I wore a white tuxedo and she wore an evening gown. And we went to the Hilton. And I have to say, from the moment he walked out on stage, he gave me my childhood back. And to see this man, to see this man then at 64 years of age, still doing what he was doing when I was a child, uh, awesome. it, it, made, it made me realize that some things in life never change and some things stay the same for the better. And he was one of those people. And at the end of his, and Elton John's lyricist, Bernie Taupin, was there that night as well. He'd actually wow. snuck in to hear Liberace play because he knew the legend that Liberace was. Um, and at the end of the concert, I, I was the first person to stand up and give him a standing ovation. And he noticed me and I thought that is the best feeling for me, that after all these years, I, I was able to give him a standing ovation and, and that he saw it. And that was 1984. When he... Uh, he passed away in 1987 and after his death, one of his neighbors in Las Vegas um, wanted to start up a petition to try and save his Las Vegas home so that it might become a museum. And um, I was still a member of the International Fan Club and she got my address and she wrote me and she asked if I would sign this petition, which I did. And we maintained a correspondence. Her name was Peggy. And we maintained a correspondence. And um, in 1988, she wrote me to say that in 1989, they were going to have uh, a celebration in honor of Liberace uh, under the auspices of the Liberace Foundation for the Creative and Performing Arts, which was part of the Liberace Museum. And she asked if I would like to come over because they were going to have a dinner in Liberace's Las Vegas home. And I thought, that's a crazy idea. I'm going to do it. And I went. I went over and um, as I said earlier, they were the most humble people, showmanship aside, they were down to earth, they were very real. And um, very awesome. at the, they, there was the luncheon, a luncheon held for in memory of Liberace at the Desert Inn in Las Vegas. And a pianist who was one of Liberace's protégés was going to play the piano at this, um, give a performance at this luncheon. And for some reason, he, he, he couldn't show up. And Liberace's sister, Angie, uh, she came to the table that I was sitting at and she said, Philip, I hear you play the piano. Can you play something like my brother, like Liberace? And I actually used to play some of his arrangements here in Australia in, in various jobs that I would do. And, and I could. So I got up and I played his arrangement of Tenderly. And as a result of that, I was invited back in 1990, 1992 and 1994 to play again, and I was invited back by the Liberace Museum to, to play there. And I, I, I believe I was the first Australian, the first outsider, uh, non-American ever to be uh, invited to play there. And from there, I, I was invited by his family and friends to stay in his Palm Springs home. Um, so after I would go to Vegas and, and perform there as, as, at, at the museum, uh, I would go and stay in his Palm Springs home as the end end part of my trip every time. And of course, in 1992, I, um, I, I was, was there as well in 94. So that's, that's how that all came about. And as I said, um, and these people treated me as if I was the special one amongst them. And I, I never received so much unconditional love from anybody. And most that's of awesome. those people, most of those people have passed away now. Uh, there are some that are still still alive that I have connections with and I would dearly love to go back. I don't know if I'd like to go back to Palm Springs because I, I, I've seen photographs of his home there in Palm Springs now and it, it has been sold and it's been changed and modernized. So what I knew of, of my time there in Palm Springs would, would now be something different. But those memories that I have, um, they're the most cherished of my life in music. Um, you know, even though it's not staunchly classical, um, it, it doesn't matter. I, I, they're just forever with me. And they're a sustaining thing in my life. Um, if ever I'm facing a hardship, I just think of the love that I receive from those people and I come on through. You know, I get through anything. That's really nice. 
You know? Yeah. That's really awesome. But that's but that's how that's how the nickname of Archie came about. That's how Anthony actually nicknamed me Archie. Uh-huh. Um, and it really stuck. I, I think I think Anthony had nicknames for everybody, you know, even within his family. <laughs> his, his father had a nickname and his brother John was known as Megzy and things like that. That's just um, him. So uh Matthew and Wyatt, do you guys have any questions? Uh no. So I do. What how what was it like filming the 1991 music video for the ABC? Who was in the costume of Dorothy the Dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> that was an oh, oh okay um that that was an awkward experience for me. Um, uh, I I believe it was Paul Field. Um, oh wow! Mm, I believe so. I can be corrected on that, but I believe it was Paul Field. And I think if you look at the, I think if you look at the Dorothy dancing in that film clip. Um, and look at the cockroaches, you might recognize some of the moves. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty Ooh. sure. But um, that that was a very awkward experience for me because I had nothing to do with the Wiggles for, for some months. I understand. I Sorry? I, I, I basically say I understand of what, yeah, why. Yeah. You know, cause you only, yeah, you know, I, we were in the Wiggles for only a year, and then you just slap, and I don't understand what you're going through while you while you're with the wiggle so i could play on stand from there it's just that like when when um anthony had come to the institute of early childhood i think it was it was in march i think that was filmed in march um and anthony was teaching uh early childhood at a jewish school here in sydney called temple emmanuel and uh, i hadn't seen him for months and he came to the office of the music room at the Institute of Early Childhood. And he asked me if I would um, come out to Temple Emmanuel one afternoon and play piano to the children there. Um, and I was hesitant at first, but I, I did. And he introduced me as the sleep inspector um, to the children. And he asked me, would I play a lullaby for them, um, you know, more to fall asleep. And I played, I played a piece of classical music, which was called The Swan um, by a French composer named um, Camille Sasson, and um, it was at that um, event, I suppose you'd call it, where Anthony asked me if I would come back and be in the Dorothy the Dinosaur film clip. That was a Thursday, and the film clip was being filmed on the following Sunday. And at first I said, no, I I did not want to do it. And um, my parents and friends, when I came home and told them, they said, no, no, you should do it, you should do it. So I phoned Anthony, I said, okay, I would do it. And Anthony asked me to meet him at his flat in, he was living in a small flat then in the Sydney suburb of Stanmore. And he asked me to meet him there, which I did. Uh, <laughs> I arrived in my Wiggles shirt. Ah, yeah. And I, I met him there. And uh, he used to drive a Tirana, which we'd nicknamed Hexo because the number plate was HXO. So I, I would call it Hexo. So he drove me to do the film clip for Dorothy the Dinosaur which was done at Darling Harbour. But my understanding, and it was never articulated to me, my understanding was that the film clip would be much like Get Ready to Wiggle, that it would be a closed set, and it would just be the band doing that one song. And we arrived at Darling Harbour, um, and there were hundreds of children there, and it was a full concert that I had to take part on, part in. Um, I had no idea what I had to do. I had no idea of what songs were being sung. Um, and Anthony never, never mentioned it on, on the way there. And I think Greg mentions this in his book, Now and Then, which came out in 2011, about um, mm. how surprised they were uh, that I showed up for the film club because they didn't even know and neither did management. They didn't know that Anthony had invited me back. Um, and, and Greg writes about that. But all I did, uh, I mean, the best I could do, and I think I do look pretty awkward in the film clip, the best I could do was follow um, Greg and Murray and copy them um and i think all considering i i didn't do a too bad a job um but that was actually the last time i, I was ever involved with the wiggles and, and that's how i came it came about that i was in that film clip drawing through the dinosaur which I, I should say where it has been said that i i'd written a letter of resignation i was advised to write that letter of resignation by by the manager jeremy fabini when it was verbally agreed that i'd stay behind the scenes and write for the second album and the reason I had to write the letter of resignation was so I would not incur expenses for any future albums. And curiously, ah. I, I did incur expenses for the recording of Here Comes a Song, even though I didn't do anything. I, I had nothing to do with the recording of it. Um, right. 
those expenses were paid back to me. Um, but I mean, that apparent letter of resignation, um, I think that that's negated by the fact that I did return to do the Dorothy the Dinosaur film clip, you know. Um, but yeah, it, w it was an awkward experience for me, but I, I seem to have gotten through it all right, I think. Um, yeah, I haven't looked at the clip for years, and I'm not going to. But you know, um, yeah. But it's, it's Paul Field. Paul, Paul Field is. Um, I can see you've got Dorothy lying on her back there behind you. Yes, he does. Yep. Uh, yep. Is it Dorothy Plush? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He can actually do the voice. It's a Dorothy voice. So yeah, I, I mean it's a Dorothy Plush. Uh, it's like it's like the new gen version of the Dorothy Plush that's made in 2013. It's, I think it's, the, it's it's the new what? What did you say? It's a the it's Dorothy like a Plush. New, I had it's, it's like a new version of it. Oh, okay. All right. I, I know there's of, plushes but, for Dorothy like way back on that those days. Yeah, I think actually my memory, and I, I, I will stand corrected on this, my memory, the costume that Paul Field is wearing in the film clip was, was made by Murray Cook's wife, Meg. She made Oh, wow. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that, but I, I, could, I, I will stand corrected. That's my memory of it. Yeah. So, so moving on from the Wiggles and continuing to continuing your work as a pianist and composer, you know, piano arrangements, do you have a a favorite piece or arrangement that you've done? Oh, yeah. Of my own? Of yeah. My own? Yeah, of, I don't... of your uh, composing and your a musician and everything that you've done. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't think about my own music all that much, and I rarely listen to it. Uh, and I don't play my own music. Um, I, which, which has to do, I think, with my spirituality. Um, uh, what I do, um, I found like when I opened my YouTube channel back in 2009, I think it was, I opened that essentially because I wanted to mentor other musicians, other young music musicians. I wanted to not inspire, but I just wanted to help, um, right. uh, younger musicians and, and composers in the same way that I had been helped. I wanted to give of my time and talent and quite freely to people who wanted to find themselves through some creative endeavor as you are finding yourself through doing what you do at YouTube. Right. Um, and that was why I opened up my YouTube channel. Um, awesome. But I have to say, the very f I think the very first upload I did was, was two studies for the piano and it was uploaded in 2009. And even to this day, whenever I upload a new piece, uh, it's like I'm sitting for an exam because, you know, people can comment on it and I'm thinking, I, I get kind of scared. So I'll upload a new piece and then I'll run and hide for a few days before I check the comments. Unfortunately, I haven't had any bad comments today, but I don't, I don't listen to my own music. I don't, um, I don't keep tabs on myself. Um, I do have several pieces of music that, um, that I've written that hold special meaning for me, like the, the piece of music I wrote following the weeks of my mother's death which is called Into Her Countenance, um, because when my mother passed away... Uh, very, sorry, very sorry to hear. I, oh, thank you, thank you. She passed, she passed away in 2005, and when she passed away, it, ah. it, she, had not, she did not have an easy life, um, and she certainly mm. did not have an easy death. It was pretty horrific. Um, but when she passed away, she was such a humble person. Uh, I promised that I would honor her life and give her modest life as much of a profile as I could through my own work and through my music. Um, and really everything I do, even if I dedicate, dedicate a piece of music to someone else, everything I do is in honor of her. Um, and I, I wrote a piece of music called Into His Countenance, which was for flute and string orchestra. Um, mm -hmm. That holds a special meaning for me, as does another piece. Um, I wrote two pieces when she was having dialysis exchanges, and I was learning how to do those dialysis exchanges. Um, I wrote two pieces of music in between being taught how to do dialysis, and one is called The Maiden Voyage, and the other one is called Simplicity Itself, and they are both for cello and piano, and um, they mean a lot to me as well. Um, any yeah. piece of music that I write for someone else that honors their life and gives a touch of immortality to their life means something to me. 
Um, but that is not to say that I follow my own career. I have no real understanding of what my status is, even among my peers. I have no real understanding of how well known I'm in, I am. Um, I know that I have had performers overseas play my work uh, as well here. And I know that there is something like 11 CDs of my music out now, and they are all played by different musicians. None of them are played, nothing's played by me because I won't play my own music. Um, I reason that if, if I can get someone else to play something of mine and they give their name to it, then that gives it greater credibility. Um, wow. So I, I, I don't know, but I, I don't follow my own career. And for the past 11 years, um, I've been a full-time carer for my father. He's now 98 years of age and he's battling dementia. So I've more or less put my musical career on hold. I, I rarely write much music now at all because I'm looking after my father. Um, but I've, I've turned to writing books now. I, I find it a much more... I'm probably doing that. Yeah. yeah, what I did when I felt like, um, when I felt like music was leaving me, um, mm. I, I personified it. I personified music and I held conversation with it. And I wanted to learn from music itself what it had taught me independently of what every teacher and mentor had taught me. And I came to find that music throughout my life has been my greatest teacher. Um, wow. And I think that's something that should be instilled in children. And that's, I think that's the whole ethos of, um, if that's a word, I'm not sure. Um, that's the whole reason behind um, early childhood music and finding what's developmentally appropriate for children. Because music is, can be a teacher, like anything in life. And, and I've, I, I'm indebted to music as an art form because it has helped to define me and it has taught me how to live my life as best I can. So I personified music and I started having conversations with it, which probably sounds a bit weird. And I wrote those conversations yeah. out. And um, from there I started to write in books of inspirational thought. At the moment I'm working on a book called Heart Matters Volume 3 um, and it's subtitled A Sense of Arrival. Um, and I write dialogues. I, I wrote a book called Divinity, which was a conversation between myself and music at the source to take in as, as many aspects of life as possible, including my belief in God and Jesus. Um, so, awesome. uh, and I, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I, I treat writing words in the same way I do writing music, um, in that words have their own texture, they have their own color, they have their own rhythm. So where any thought I might have is random, my choice of words in expressing that thought is not. Um, I, will write a, like, I will write a sentence or a paragraph. I will work on it the same way I will shape a piece of music. I'll be conscious of the rhythm of the words and their inflection and the texture. Um, and I'm very rewarded by doing that. And I think the whole, the whole quest behind my, my life as a creative person from eight years of age through to now and however long I live will be to know myself that little bit more. Um, and it's a humbling experience because if your life as a creative person, if you're involved in art, if it hasn't taught you about humility, then what has it taught you? Because the whole idea behind creating something, it is to acknowledge love in your life because love is what created us. So you give that back. Yep. And, and that, that, that's my whole belief in life. People might think I'm a little bit pie in the sky, but that's, that's been my goal from day one. And awesome. with, with my book writing, I have hoped that whatever legacy I leave, and it's not for me to say whether my legacy will be worthwhile or not, that my words, my books complement my music and they are born of each other. Um, but I think that, and I, I think that's how people should live their lives. I think, um, I think we should all live our lives as history in the making. And by that, you don't have to live a grand life. You just have to live, a not, live an honest life. Um, you're living your life now as history in the making with this YouTube channel and your interviews with other people. Mm -hmm. um, can, I, can I share another story with you? Of course. Oh, sure. Okay, sure. Exactly. Of this, course. Hmm. Okay, this touches my heart and I'm probably gonna cry. I'm, I'm gonna cry. Um, when I was a child, I used to watch a television show. Uh, I was 12, 13 years of age. And the show was called uh -huh. Good Morning. 
It was called Good Morning, and it was hosted by a very, very beautiful lady named Rosemary Ether, E-A-T-H-E-R. Mm-hmm. And she was the love of my early childhood life. I used to walk around the house singing this song, uh, Edison Lighthouse song called Love, Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes, you know. And I would write her lots of fan letters. And at the height of her, 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 her fame here in Australia, um, she was receiving something like 50,000 letters, fan letters a week from children. And I was one of those oh, children. Goodness. Wow. And on her show, on her show, she would uh, have a, a segment called Fun With Drawing. It was an educational show because she had been a science teacher previously. Um, and it was also an entertainment thing. And on her show, she had a segment called Fun With Drawing. And I would enter drawings and she would show them on television and, and award prizes. And one of the prizes actually that she, she gave me was a, a concise Oxford dictionary. And that was back in 1970. I still use that dictionary to this day wow. because, she gave, uh, because she gave it to me. Um, and we wrote letters and she replied to every fan letter that I wrote her. Oh my, wow. from every one, she sent me signed photos and through my childhood, right up to my early adult years, up to 1990, actually, we maintained a correspondence. When she married, she even sent me postcards from those places that she visited with her husband on their honeymoon. She oh sent me goodness. photographs of her children when they were born. And we maintained this contact for right through to 1990. Some of the letters that she wrote me, uh, total, the longest letter she wrote me was 23 pages long. Um, the reason they were so lengthy was because she lived such a busy life. She couldn't sit down and write a letter. Yeah, you know, she didn't have enough time to write one letter. So she would do a progressive letter. So there were pages and pages. Anyway, the point of, of this goes back to me saying that I think we should all live our life as history in the making. Okay, keep that thought in mind. Mm -hmm. um, it was only within the last few years that I was able to find her again. Uh, I decided to search Facebook for one of her sons and I touched base with him. I wasn't sure if she was still alive or not. And he wrote me back that she was. And she's now something like 80 years of age. Oh uh, my gosh. And uh, he, I think because of her fame, he was very guarded and um, he didn't really want to give me any details about her life as it is now or, or how I could contact her without me. Uh, telling him something of myself. So he asked me in a private message, could I tell him a bit of my own history? So rather than do that, I told him about his own life, what I knew from letters he wrote my mother. Like I would say, do you remember the, the photograph that was taken of you in the space suit standing before the Christmas tree when you were like three years old or something? So I, rather than tell him about me and my life, I told him everything I knew about his childhood to prove mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I was a legitimate person. And, um, one day the phone rang and it was him and he told me, okay, here's where I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, Here you go. He, he told me that he had his mother on the phone to talk to me. He had Rosemary on the phone to talk to me. So for the, the few seconds that he was passing the phone to her to talk to me, I had not heard her voice in 45 years. Wow. Um, the feeling of, of, of hearing her voice after all that time was so overwhelming. So I send her now every month, I send her a bouquet of yellow flowers, yellow roses, so that she knows she's not forgotten by me. But here's my point. Here's my point. Um, her son recently donated to the National Film and Sound Archive in Canberra, the Australian Capital Territory. So all of her papers, he, he dedicated all of her papers all press clippings about her life, everything to do with her career, so that they would be archived by the National Film and Sound Archive. Amongst those papers that he donated were all the letters that I had written her as a child. She'd kept them. She'd kept all my letters. So the archivist at the National Film and Sound Archive in turn contacted me to see if by chance I had any of her letters to me and would I consider donating one or two of them as part of the display there. Well, I had every letter. I had a huge wad of letters, like a, a mountain of them. And I have recently donated all of her letters to the archive and they're there wow. for safekeeping. Mm -hmm. And they're there on display. They're going to be on display with all of her letters to me. And my point is 
about you know how I said live your life as history in the making. Yeah. Right. Who would have thought that letters that I were write I was writing a huge celebrity at twelve and thirteen years of age today would be archived in the National Film and Sound Archive in our wow. in our Australian yeah. Capital Territory. So I was creating at, at that young age, as much as I did not know it, I, I was creating a little bit of history. Um, and it's it's I mean I mean the beauty of it now for me is that I've been able to contribute something to her legacy. And um, she's still a part of my life and and, um, and and I love her very much. So yeah, live your life as history in the making. And like I said before, you don't have to it doesn't have to be a grand life. Uh, you just have to live an honest life, no matter what your career path is, whether you work in a bank or whether you're a sales assistant or a street sweeper or whatever, or whether you're a, a, a big name in music, um, just live your life honestly. Um, and that's all you have to do to live a meaningful life. You know, that is my belief. Great words. Great words of what you said, because that's really true. what more people have to know about it. But um, that's what, before before I came to talk to you, like at the beginning of this, that's what you're doing with your YouTube channel, whether you realize it or not. Years down the track, you've created history here with what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. For yeah, and people can go back and watch it. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. 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 Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And you're giving, you're you're adding to the profile of the people you're into. For, forget about me, but, but the people that you've interviewed before me, you're adding to the profile of their life. Um, I didn't, the, those people that I, I mean, the interviews I've watched, I didn't know those people before you interviewed them. So, I mean, I'm, you know, a bit of a bubble boy, I admit. Wow. Um, but uh, I know of them now through you. Um, and, and that's an extraordinary thing. Wow. Very, very touch for saying that. So thank you so much. Um, but I, I know you really did have a blissful feeling of what would that happen that you, you know, you cry and all. And and as well as what happened that we talked that we talked about earlier. Well, you mostly about uh, what the performances that some of people that like heroes of your of your life, like Which you know, one? Like, this one, like like died and all. And and um. I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think I would say no. that, that. Well, I, I suppose Liberace yeah, as a child, he was a hero, but I mean, um, I don't, I don't adulate people. Um, I respect them for their talent and how they use it and how they express it. Um, and as I like most of my training, of course, was classical and there are people, uh, in the history of music whose lives as performers as well as composers and creative entities resonate for me more than most. I think in the world of pop and rock or whatever you call it, um, there are people who, Michael Jackson was huge. I, I saw him, I saw him live here in Australia back in the late eighties, I think it was. Oh my yeah. gosh. That's, uh, yeah, is it the tour? What? Is that the I don't, I can't remember. That's crazy. I can't remember that. I can't, he, he was playing at, at Parramatta stadium Parramatta Park yeah. it was 19, maybe it was 1989 yeah it's actually um, here because me and Jake are pretty big uh Michael Jackson fans so well well let, let me tell you um yeah it, it was an experience because um I suppose that I, I was fascinated because fascinated by him mostly because in interviews he appears he always appeared to be very fragile and um but on stage he was a force to be reckoned with. It was overwhelming. And my memory is that his entry on stage, it was an open arena. Uh, his entry on stage, he shot up through the stage mm -hmm. and just stood there with his hands on his hip and his head turned to the left or to the left. Oh! No, his head turned to the right. Oh, and I think I know what you're talking about. I think it's, I think you're talking about the Dangerous Tour. I think that's what the, that's I'm, I'm, the start sure. of the tour. Every single but concert his, that he did, like, he did that. Yes. Yes, then he takes his glasses the off and then starts jamming and then boom. Yes, but he, here's the thing. He struck that pose for probably the best part of five minutes. He just stood there and didn't do anything. And the whole audience, everybody, hundreds of thousands of people, it was pandemonium. People were screaming. No. And he didn't even have to do anything. He just had to stand there. Um, but then, yes, I, one of my regrets is to, this is more, in more recent times, um, uh, Prince was was playing the Sydney Opera House. I think it was a year before he passed away. And I would have loved to have gone to hear Prince um, live um, because I've always had this feeling that Prince 
kind of musically gatecrashed the party that Michael Jackson started. Um, and I think I, I perhaps favor Prince over, over Michael Jackson um, uh, as a songwriter. But um, and I, of course, because I was a, a full time carer looking after my father, I couldn't couldn't go to the concert. And I regret that. But the review that Prince received in the press after his opera house performance was a review that any musician, no matter what your genre, w would die for. It was the most wonderful review. And um, it actually broke my heart when he passed away. But of those musicians who, if I, like I'm talking about rock and, and pop musicians, not classical, those musicians, rock and pop musicians that I, I would probably like to meet, not so much to adulate, but just to say, you know, thank you, I respect you for what you did, uh, would be Jeff Buckley. Um, Jeff Buckley is my yardstick for most contemporary musicians. He's my go-to when I want to uh, hear the very best, hear genius at work. I hear it in Jeff Buckley. Um, Kurt Cobain, who I never really knew much about until quite recently, and I watched an interview with him, and the humility in his heart resonated volumes for me, so that was Kurt Cobain. And uh, so I regret that I, I didn't know of their work before they passed away. Uh, but I certainly know of it now. And more recently, uh, Harry Styles. Oh, and I did, oh, wow. I've never, okay, I've never, I have never followed One Direction. Wow. I would, not, I would not be able to tell you a title of a One Direction song. Um, but it was only by chance that in 2020, I think, I caught his performance of Falling at the Brit Awards. Um, and... I was overwhelmed by it. And the reason I was overwhelmed by it was that he wore his heart on his sleeve in that performance. And it was something quite remarkable for me to, to watch and to listen to. And I understand that during the week, just for the days leading up to that performance, um, he'd lost uh, uh, a very dear friend, had, had, had passed away. And he'd also been, I think, um, robbed at Knife Point in London. And he still fronted up and gave this performance of Falling for the Brit Awards. And, and it's on YouTube. And um, I, I, I just found that to be really remarkable. And I, I, I then searched out more works of him. And I listened to one or two interviews, one lengthy interview where he talked about um, his, the creative process that he goes through in, in writing a song and whatever. And he's the real deal. Uh, talking about music and, and, and composition and how he writes a song uh, he knows what he's doing. And I think that younger people the world over can be grateful for the fact that he's, uh, he's, um, he's a bit of a, a mental figure for them. Um, I have mountains of respect for him. So those three musicians, I think, Jeff Buckley, Kurt Cobain and Harry Styles, David Bowie. Oh, yes, David Bowie. Bowie's in everything. I mean, you know, uh, Bowie's like the bark of, of contemporary contemporary music, I think. But yeah, Michael Jackson, um, it was a phenomenal concert. And as I said, my, my, I, I was intrigued um, to actually witness it because in, in interviews, he's, he's so fragile, but uh, on stage, he's anything but. He's a huge, he's a huge phenomenon. Yeah, very, um, yeah, very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that it was very heartbreaking after he died. I, I, I don't know if Michael Jackson or Prince after their death which is like a few years after, you know, after their death, but it's really remarkable. Also, I forgot to say this. Um, Tyler Armstrong is also a fan of Michael Jackson too. Oh, I know, you know. I know. We've we've talked about him, yes. And also, um, that's awesome. um, oh, buddy, um, the in Michael Jackson impersonator on on uh, Instagram, Buddy Cat. Oh, who can we not remember his name? He knows who he is. But anyway, yeah, it was funny because when I was in the, when I was awesome. in Las Vegas for um the um, have you got time for another story? Oh yeah, we yeah. know. Oh, okay. Yeah, when, when so much stories already, right, you know. We love hearing your right. stories. They're yeah. actually they're really cool. In Las Vegas yeah. um, for the Liberace celebrations. I think it was in nineteen. It was the nineteen ninety two ones in May of nineteen ninety two. Um, it was the first year that the Liberace Foundation had decided to uh, create what they called the Liberace Legend Award. And it was an award that was to be given to performers and celebrities in recognition of, of their work. Like one year, Siegfried and Roy received the award. The evening I was there, um, 
And the very first recipient of, of the Liberace Legend Award was Debbie Reynolds. Do you know Debbie Reynolds? Um, okay. Yes. Princess, Princess yes. Leia from, from Halloween Star Town. Wars. Yeah. Debbie Reynolds. Oh, okay. yeah, I know her from Halloween yeah, Town, yeah. yeah. And um, I actually had dinner with Debbie Reynolds. I actually sat at arm's length across from her at a table. And, oh, and my I goodness. That's awesome. I, I know. And I have to say, she, she had the most beautiful skin. Like, she was a radiant woman and very beautiful. But she was being presented with this, this war award, um, which from memory was a crystal, crystal candelabra, because the candelabra was Liberace's logo. Um, but at this awards night, I, I was standing with... Um, another pianist friend uh, there at the museum uh, waiting for this award to be presented. And I saw, uh, this was 19, yeah, 1992, I saw, I saw what I thought was Michael Jackson walking towards me. And I, I looked at my pianist friend, you know, the, um, the, the fellow that, that was, I, I was with, um, and you know, I think he saw the blood drain from my face because Michael, Michael Jackson was sort of coming up to me. But it, it turned out to be the Michael Jackson impersonator uh, that worked for the Legends show in Las Vegas. And the curious thing about it was that, you know, how Michael Jackson had the cosmetic surgery and whatever. Yeah. Um, right. this, this impersonator had actually had cosmetic surgery to look my, like Michael Jackson after Michael Jackson had 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 cosmetic surgery. So it was kind of, but he looked, he looked exactly like him. It was like, you know, it was, it was kind of scary, but yeah. Um, so you that, know, that was like, nice. like 12 years now. Sorry? Which I know that he like, you know, he like, uh, that, um, I guess you could say, well, when we're in this, what I was trying to say about that. How long, how long has Michael Jackson been gone now? Like for twelve years now, like June twenty fifth, two thousand nine. That's what oh, they died. Okay. Yeah. So I was about, I was about like five years old since when that happened. Because my birthday was June twenty sixth. I was born two thousand four. So. What, what's your favorite Michael Jackson song? I don't know. I honestly have no idea. I I, I like so many like Michael Jackson. I'm just like okay. my five favorites. Okay, definitely Jam, um, Bad, um, Smooth Criminal, um, Ball on a Dance Floor, and. And um, well, there's so there's so much, so much amazing Michael Jackson songs. My but... two, my two, and I, I I play them against one another whenever I listen to them. Is childhood, Very awesome. yeah. Um, and the one uh, is to do with the Earth and what have we done? I can't remember the title of it right now. Um, is it Earth song? I don't know. I can't remember. Um, yeah, those. But yeah, I mean, he he. You can't deny that he was a phenomenon and a living phenomenon. Right, yeah. and, and his dancing was extraordinary. Like the Billie Jean film clip is is just exactly yeah. Especially the, the 1983 uh, his, her, his first ever moonwalk, moose ever oh, moonwalk. Gosh, yeah. Yes. yeah, and I'd I'd say my favorite. Well, prob well, this is probably one I of the first. Mis I I want to get Mistress the Monkey to do the moonwalk. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite songs is Black or White. That was probably one of the oh, first Michael yeah. Jackson songs I've heard. Yes. Um, one of my no, favorites but, is the... But the, I mean, Good these song. are phenomenal people, and I, I think they're an energy that... that, that um, yeah. I know that Michael Jackson... I know that Michael Jackson was like, was he was was going on tour, like we're just like his last ever tour, which is like this is their tour, and then all that oh, yeah. didn't happen because of his death, which is super unfortunate. Did you see the movie? Did you see the film? This is it. Well, well, Michael Jackson was originally going to do a tour, which is called This Is It, but but his like the documentary I, movie, the the documentary film called This Is It. Did you see that? I knew well, about that movie. There's a wonderful, there's a wonderful scene in it, and I mean, it's years since I've seen it, and and I, I, yeah, I can't really yeah, articulate it, it. yeah. So that's, there's, there's one, there's one moment I think when he's in rehearsal or whatever, and he stops rehearsing. I, I he says something about being bathed, about the sound like being bathed in it, like moonlight or something. I can't remember, but it was a beautiful thing that he said, and um, wow. it, it, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, but these people are the real thing. They're what I call the real thing, and I, I think that what they do. Um, and this is the same with Jeff Buckley, especially, and, and Prince and whatever. Yeah. Again, and with Liberace, showmanship aside, um, there's humility in their heart, and that gives them, them their strength to do what they do. And um, it, it's a very, it's actually a very beautiful thing, you know. Yeah. I don't think you can create like that and not, say, believe in God. 
because God is your imagination. Whether you believe in God, I mean, I'm not saying God is a person, you know, but it's the energy at work in this world that sees us survive. And when you do something creatively, you are engaging yourself with that energy that we call God or love or whatever. Um, what do you call it? Or faith, and that's or what faith. gives you the sustaining power to do what you do, you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So, so I want to go over some things about, so from earlier that, well, I'm just going to say that, I'm, like I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear about, about what, you know, like die and all, and especially what, what your experience before you became, you know, part of Wiggles, you know, it's like the, um, the playing the liberous, like, celebrations. Um, also shout out to you, Will, Will Wagner and Tal Armstrong about for you know about the mission of the monkey for you know you did yes. like I said, what Philip said you, you both did a fantastic job. Um, okay, this is kind of interesting what I'm about to say. Since you really, really like you know super liked to mission of the monkey, I'm kind of wondering like <laughs> what happened if mission of the monkey was like a wiggly friend. You know, mission of the monkey was actually the first summer mascot before. Yes, yes. I, I, I believe so. Dorothy was. I, I believe so. I, I remember one time, um, uh, it was not long after I'd written Mr. the Monkey, meeting Anthony at Sydney University, not, not the university where he'd studied, but on the grounds uh, at Sydney University. And um, we were, just him and I, him and myself, yeah. we were looking towards creating a film clip for Mr. the Monkey, and he would the jungle like that Mr. the monkey would be in uh the leaves that would fall from the trees would turn into musical notes as they fell yeah. um but that wasn't really interesting and it wasn't until 2011 when i read greg's book um mm -hmm. that i learned that for the first few concerts that the wiggles did Mr. was the mascot at least Greg oh. says that in his book. I did not know that. I, I did not know that Mr. had that profile um, in the very beginning with the Wiggles mm. at all. It's, it's funny, um, you know, it's three years ago, so very long look, time ago. I've got, I hey, have, my I probably don't whole, remember some things. I have a whole mountain of ideas that I keep throwing at Tyler Armstrong and, and Will about Mr. you know, like Mr. the Moon Monkey doing the moonwalk or something. Or, <laughs> uh, that would be amazing. I, that would be funny. Uh, I don't know. Um, me off. Not, not too long ago, like, I was imagining, like, if Mischief, like, were to have his own, like, TV show or something. Oh, oh he's, that'd he's, be look, he's got, a, he's got an ego. He would need the best dressing room. He would need a mountain of bananas. Um, yeah, Mischief. <laughs> but, he's, he's, and then he goes on to be, like, one of the most popular children's characters, like, oh, out there. You know, it's fate, it's destiny, it's going to happen, I think. <laughs> I don't know. But, yeah, it, it, it's, it, he's, he's kind of... Um, yeah, he's a good fellow, Mister. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or think about this: he could come back into the Wiggles. Like they got Bach now, bring him back as a puppet. Oh yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, Bach was actually Rosemary Hall used to have a have a puppet that was her mascot when she taught classes, wow. and, and oh, it was named I... it was named Bach, and um, it, it, it came the name Bach came from the composer, the Italian composer Bogarini. Um, and she used to carry Bach with her to classes, and and he'd, he'd sit beside her when she taught. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, that's where they. Go. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so what? So, I think we're almost like in, almost to like wrap, but I'm gonna give like you know a couple of you know. So, um, so what happened is that, from my sense here, is that after you know you're not you know. Of course, after debut album and by 1992, where you're not in, like, you know, of course, not, not Wiggle anymore. Is that where you just, you signed a little, little bit for the Here Comes the Song album, like for the future albums, which we already been mentioned that. But, but to be honest, I'm super, like, blessed. I'm so much fans still remember me that, that that you talked about earlier. And, and as well for, you know, okay, so I have an interesting question here anyway. So, okay. two is... One, what is your favorite instrument instead of piano? And two, um, so since you made books and all, do you have a favorite book? I know you said later, like Pat in the earlier that you're not you're not really much into your work, but if you if you do have like your favorite book that you most enjoy doing it anyway, then what is your favorite? Okay, my favorite instrument, and even my favorite instrument to write for as a composer is the cello. Mm -hmm. 
Ooh. Wow. Um, because the sound of the cello, oh. um, it aligns itself with the human voice so naturally. And regardless of what anyone might say, music, uh, mm. first and foremost, is a vocal conception. It doesn't matter what instrument you're writing for, whether you're writing for a flute, a cello, or the orchestra. It is first and foremost a vocal conception because the first music ever came through bird, bird song. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So you think, as a composer, I, I think of music melodically. I think of it as song, regardless of what instrument I'm writing for. And the cello is the one instrument that seems to sit well within my own voice. Mm -hmm. speaking um and it's an absolute joy to write for i i wrote um there's a double cd out called the voice of love which is actually dedicated to rosemary Ether, the um the children's host who you know i was telling you about that i used to write to as a child um wow. and it's, it's it is all music for cello and piano mm -hmm. and the title track on that book on, on that double cd the voice of love is dedicated to rosemary Ether, um which is the different rosemary of course to you know Anthony and, and Murray and Greg's seizure. Right. Um, what was the other question you asked me? Oh, about books. Do, do I have favorite a favorite book. book? A favorite book of my own? Mm -hmm. Yep. The one I'm. Yeah. The one I'm. Uh, oh, okay. 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 I'm wait. Phil, oh, look okay. at this. Right. You have in, your book. In, fl in flowers in flight. In flowers in flight, you'll find all the poems that I wrote for "Here Comes a Song" that never eventuated. Mm -hmm. Very true. As well. Which I have those um, in two books. And there's a children's pantomime in there, or, or what was going to be a children's pantomime called Bebop, which is about um, a queen bee and you know her, her, her drones and whatever. Um, but my favorite book, I would say, would be the one that I'm working on at the time, you know, whatever that book is. But again, I, I don't follow myself. I don't keep tabs on myself, so I don't sort right. of read my um, In the more philosophical, I suppose, inspirational type, books where I'm, where I'm just jotting down inspirational thoughts for people, the books that I've called Heart Matters. I've had actual, I've had people quote me back to myself and I have no idea what they're talking about half the time, and yet I wrote it, you know. So I, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't really, I, anything I do, anything I create, um, I leave it because I, I let it go because it has to learn, it has to live a life of its own after you've done it. Yeah. Um, and I don't do anything for myself, I do it for, whoever comes along that might find enjoyment mm -hmm. out of it or inspiration out of it, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, because the whole point, the whole point about life is moving forward all the time. And you have to do that when you're creating as well. You can't stand still. You've always got to look to the future and positively right. move, forward, mm -hmm. move forward. Yeah. Very true. And there. you learn that, you learn that from nature too, because in, in, at the crest, you know, uh, at the crest of each wave is the new wave that's going to come forward in, in the sea. You know, you, I mean, it's, it's everywhere in nature. Everything moves forward. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes you take a step back, but, you know, that's a reflective moment. You must always move forward and with hope in your heart as well to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so earlier that Wyatt told me that I can actually, I can actually do Dorothy voice. You can't, can I, can I can you hear what, <laughs> of my Dorothy voice? Yes. Yes. He could do you do the Dorothy, Dorothy voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does yeah. exactly. yeah, okay. tribute bands. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, Dude, I've seen you dance. I've seen you. You've got pretty awesome moves. <laughs> I've, I've seen you dance. <laughs> there, um, there you, there you go. Get another fan. No, you, uh, seriously, seriously, you could have taught me. You could have taught me how to dance for the Wiggles. But, um, because <laughs> I'm pretty so much because you know the Wiggles. You know, after your, you know, your, you know, <laughs> your, your way, so, way after your days. <laughs> oh. But uh, what you, you do, when you say you do the Dorothy voice, are you saying that you do the voice that Mari did during the song? Uh, he yeah, does. He does person. his own version of it. Yeah, I was about to say he's, he's uh, developed his own kind of Dorothy voice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, let's hear it. Let's hear right. it. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I used to oh, awesome. I used to be able to pull off a good Dorothy voice, but as my voice matured over the years, I've kind of lost that ability. Who's that speaking now that just said that? That's Chris. Yeah. That's Chris. Okay, you've yeah, got a really good resonance. You, you've got a fine resonance to your voice. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's a good sound. It's a good sound. It, but yeah, think but yeah, thanks by the way, um, Philip, that you like my Dorothy voice. <laughs> And oh, yeah, Greg on, uh, hey, Greg on here. Jakey he could teach him some old moves. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see that Jakey versus Greg dance off. Yeah. <laughs> he would win. 
it's very interesting that Murray actually did 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 the, the voice for Dorothy on, on, on your days and same as for Paul Field. That is that's really amazing. Mm-hmm. It's the moves that he's done like for the it's, it's it's very amazing. And you know how much Dorothy voice it has over the years after so I have I mean I, I have I have no idea of I mean I haven't followed the Wiggles all these years. I, I don't know much about them really um mm-hmm. since since my time with them. So um and it's only been this year with the 30th anniversary since people have been sending me messages and I've been getting, I've actually formed new friendships such as Tyler and, and Will and yourself. Um, and it's, it's, it's rather lovely um, that I have, have new friends in my life. And, um, uh, but I, I haven't, I, I don't really know much about the Wiggles careers since and, and, and what Yes, done. you don't really know much, but like so, no. you know, after Wiggles fans told you and then you know more, a little bit more about the Wiggles. Yes. So it's a good, yes. it's a good thing. Yes. Yes. And they're still going to this day. Mm-hmm. After Is three what, years, what and, and, and Anthony still wiggle after three yeah, years. Yes, I've, I've seen it's that. Crazy. Seen that. Like literally, literally goes to show that no matter what age you are, you can still be a wiggle. Yeah. yeah when so, when did uh, I, when did Murray and um um uh, Jordan Murray Jeff Grace and... definitely 2012. Oh, okay. Oh, that's quite. Chris actually was almost, like, ten, Chris almost ten years one ago. Of the final shows. I, I touched. I, I mean, I touched base with Greg back in 2011. Um, yeah. Oh wow. Because about, about the when he, uh, uh, yes, yes, when he, um, someone, um, a friend had told me that that he'd written about me in um, in his book in the the Wiggly Genesis, I think is the title of the chapter, um, and he wrote he wrote kind things about me. Um, so I, I went out and bought it. I'm so glad it. the Wiggles still matching you, especially. Especially Greg and Anthony, though I'm glad Greg, though Greg, they Greg, still respect you and they wear everything you've done. Greg, Greg has paid me um, probably the most tribute than anybody, I think, and I'm grateful for what he wrote. Um, and it's worked for the Wiggles too. Yes, and and, and, and the OGs I, and everyone else. I um I emailed him at the time back in 2011 to thank him, and I, I knew he'd had some health concerns back then in 2011. So yeah. I, I um yeah, because he wasn't really wiggle at that time. So just just yeah. because of his oral mm. tolerance. So, but and, of course, last, and then and then of course he, last he, year, he, he, he replied. He replied back to me, and um, yeah, oh, in, yeah, in his reply. Us. In his reply, he, should, he, he wrote me that um, my contributions to the David album shouldn't be forgotten, which was very, very kind of him. But wow. that's, the only, wow. that's the only contact I've had with him since then. And that was, what, 10 years ago? Yeah. Well, thank like, you know, for the band story, and that's why I called the David album, you know, so. Mm. Chris, go but ahead. I, I believe... you were... Sorry? He, Chris said something about something that happened last year with Greg. Oh, yeah, of course, the thing that happened last year with Greg's uh, cardiac arrest. Yes, I, I, I saw too. I saw something about that on uh, on YouTube, but I, I believe he's doing well now, and he's actually a sports yeah. person. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's part of Heart yeah. Nation, and and for and, and LEDs or something that's called um for like you know what it's, it's, it, and, it kind of it kind of harkens back to what I said earlier. I think about turning yeah. any hardship you have into in, in your life into your hardship, right? And just sailing on through. And and um, I think if you if you have anything negative that happens into your life no matter what it is you can turn it into a positive and that's clearly what greg has done and he yep. should be committed very awesome on. very yeah. awesome so yeah. Yeah. yeah so so uh we're almost to a wrap here so 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 um so if any people wants to see your youtube channel or your social media where you can find find them or oh, the the youtube channel is just under my name you know, but you won't find um, it. Basically, I think there's something. There's over 300 uploads, over 300 pieces of music there at my channel Jeez. that I've written. That I've written. But you won't find. You won't find. It, it's mostly all performed by other musicians. Other musicians who have recorded my works. Um, I don't. I don't play much. There's one or two where you'll hear me playing, but um, you know, uh, it's uh, but one of the, the 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 pianists that first recorded any piano works of mine. Her name is Janelle Carrigan. Yeah. And I owe her the a most enormous debt of gratitude because I think without her having taken up my music in the first place mm-hmm. to record it, I would not have the profile I've got. And you know, she's worked with Gertz Richter, who is her husband, recording my music as well. Me and a co a cellist, and like the, and John Martin, the Australian pianist, has has recorded my music and and, and a lot of people. Wow, and I have the awesome. best publisher. I have a, Anne and Brennan Keats, who won, who run Wirrapang Publications. They look after me very well, and they look after all Australian composers very well. So I'm blessed to have them in my life as well. You're awesome. 
Um, mm-hmm. I'm so glad for like for with all of that what the Wiggles done. So, um, also where people can buy your books. <laughs> um, where people buy from, your- from not not from bookstores. You can't get them in bookstores. Um, you can get them from my publisher, We're Pang. Um, and I'm, I'm always, I always have copies that I can send to people as gifts as well, which I like to do. I prefer more to give my things away. Even my music, I prefer to give it away rather than to make money off it because I've always felt that I came into this world to write music, not make money, you know? Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so I like, I, I, I like to gift, make gifts of things to people and give them away. Very yes. awesome. So well, probably, can, probably can just, just. Just send it to to, to why Chris and, and Matthew. Of course, now. <laughs> of course. Look, if you touch base with me um, in a private message somehow, I'd be happy to send you things. Yeah, <laughs> that would be nice. Thank you. Um, so, so one more question. Um, if anyone wants to get into like piano or just music in general, do you have like any advice for oh, yeah. someone who wants to get That's into that advice. field? Do you mean get into it as in finding a teacher or, 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 or what would be my best? Really done that, yeah, you like know, what anyone who wants to have like music as a career, like, you know, composing. Oh, I, um, I, th- well, I mean, if you haven't already studied music, you would have to get a teacher, of course, and learn it. But I think um, my advice to anybody in life, and like I've, I've said before, no matter what you're doing, whether it's music or whatever, um the best thing you can be is true to yourself because when you're true to yourself you're honest to others um and i I think i think music um it can be a bit of a cutthroat business um there are some i think in 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 larger recording industry type affairs um um an artist can be treated more like a commodity rather than a human being that can be a bit tricky to deal with um that would not suit me that would not suit my personality which is why with my publishers Anne and brennan keats at we're I'm, I'm very happy to be with them because it's just a small it's just a small thing and um um but they are interested in me as a person as well and and they've done a lot for australian music um but yeah i i, I i'm not going to talk about music uh, specifically i'm just going to say that no matter what you're doing in your life uh, be honest with yourself, and then you're honest with others, and as much as possible, mm-hmm. live your life as history in the making, because that's what you're doing. Yeah, um, and it, well it's doing. how you want to be remembered when you leave when you leave this 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 earth or whatever. You know, uh, think about how you want to be remembered and live your life according to that, um, and understand that everything that, that that is sent your way is a blessing, and it's what you take from it, it's what you do with it, and uh, that really matters more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, if you guys want to, you, know, you guys want to follow his YouTube and his, you know, social media, you can. It's going to be in the description below, so you don't need to search it up and anything. It is. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it will be. So, <laughs> Thank mm-hmm. you for that. You're very welcome. So, before further wrap up, is there anything you, you're trying to say, Wyatt? No. Thank look, you for just... taking the time out of your schedule to do this. Yes. Oh, Thanks. I look. It's my my dad. It's it's actually happened at a at an opportune time because um my father had a fall um the Wednesday uh, before last oh, and he's in hospital at the moment. Um, oh. He's doing well though. He's ninety eight. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad he's doing well. I'm really glad you really take take yes. care of your own father, yeah. which is really a good person that you you can like be. So so we, so we this is happening. This this has happened at a, at a at a at an opportune time in that I can actually pay attention to you and and, and you know and yeah. uh, give you something there. So um, it, awesome. it's all worked out rather well. And I, mm-hmm. and honestly, it's more of it's more of an honor for me that you um, you've invited me onto your show and that you've you're very welcome, well, Philip. You know. Yes, mm-hmm. it's been an honor having you on it's here. Yes, been, yeah, been on here. So um, honestly, I can't wait. All of us are we appreciate you having on the show and can't wait for more. Into the future. Oh yeah. One thing and we have to do is is on, can you? On. Yeah. Well, oh you know, no. no. Hopefully Robert? we can have you back on with Greg or Murray. Oh yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Really? Who knows? Anyway, but, uh, request. <laughs> who knows? Really? What, what, what you said? What, what why? Oh, I, I missed. I missed. You were going to say something else, though, weren't you, Jake? Uh, 
So, Cam, since we're about to about to end off here, and it's a good time for do so. It's a fine for you. We cite Miss Shep the Monkey. <laughs> I can't. Oh yeah, a, I, hear you. Uh, I haven't. I haven't got a mischievous voice like Anthony. Um, you, you, can't Anthony. Just, you can't. You can just speak by your own. You can. You only need to do Miss Shep voice. Okay, I will pretend I'm just maybe talking to one child or something. <laughs> mischief, mischief the monkey, bananas galore. He'll eat a whole bunch and cry out for more. If you search through the jungle, you'll see what I mean. He's gobbled them up, all yellow and green. Well, that yellow do. and green. Yeah, well, that, well, that's that's awesome. Do. Very awesome. Yeah. It's 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 really it's, it's really interesting that. Okay, I have to say this fact here that the wiggle pin and everything that I said that, that you sing you sing not sing sorry speak the song, but be it, you said to me that it was actually Anthony. Yes, he he's he's reciting. The actual verse on on the CD. And awesome. his... I don't know who the heck who thinking Philip seen this. Did did Anthony did a song when you didn't do it when lots of people you thought hear, it was you did the song. Probably because you, you wasn't hear... really part of the album and you just write stuff and you write. And I think you people thought know that you write the song that made me thinking people like know that you recite the song. Probably that's why they think it's you, but it was actually oh. like Anthony. So no, you hear why. me. But I'm glad you you, you said that you got the right information because you know, the more white information we got, the more understanding Google's fans can be. So thank you for that. Yeah, you'll hear yeah. you'll hear me you'll hear me sing on Spot the Dalmatian. I, oh, I sing, oh, oh. I sing, very cool. I will sing the I very sing the verse that starts off "Fill the platypus lost his duck's bill." That's Ooh. me. Um, oh, nice. And I, I think I'm on Froggy. Well, I, I think I sing on Froggy as well. Very awesome. Yeah. Big Tyler, one of his Roblox bands, actually does that song now. With Tyler, yeah, one of his Roblox bands does that song, aka Spot the Dalmatian. Oh, oh, really? Oh, okay. yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm so glad people just, just sit still, sing and talk about the debut album, which is super nice. And hopefully, in, in the future, now, um, uh, we can get somehow we can we can get a really release of the debut album. Who knows? But anyways, all I'm gonna say is again, thank you so much for having and on our show, Philip, and see what's what's happening. More mm-hmm. for you. No, it's, it's it's my absolute pleasure, and thank you for inviting me. And you're, um, you're very welcome, mate. And stay in touch, okay? Oh, of course, of, of course, all of us are going to stay in touch. You're 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 amazing. You're an amazing person, Phil. No, I'm not. No, 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 no. no. You're amazing. Um, no, uh, thank you, thank, <laughs> you. thank you again. And um, I hope um, I hope everything is fine over there in, in, it is. in Maryland with what's okay. going on in the world and things. So, like thank you so much for it. Words. All right. Yeah, right. Okay. Would you come back in the future? To the show? Yeah. To to your show and be interviewed again? Yeah. Or do no. you mean back to America? <laughs> On the show in the future. Yes, of course, if you wish. Why not? Very, very awesome. And and lastly, sorry sorry about this, but if any people thinking about like you being a part of the project, like for um you can say about it, because I know you what you're trying to say what what I mean about it, Chris. About like where Philip like in the future that he, he he like somehow he'll be be a part of some stuff for the Wiggles for the 30th anniversary. Yeah. Like, would I be a part of Would I be a part of anything? Like, for the 30th anniversary, of Wiggles, if like if if like if Anthony or Greg or say some say something to you about being a part of something for the Wiggles for the 30th anniversary, would you be down for it? <laughs> I don't know. What I would like to see happen more than anything would perhaps be the re-release of the Debo album as a global fundraiser for COVID. I, I think yeah. that's a viable it, idea. I understand where you're going from there, and you know, yeah. I and think same as for and same as for like what the future, what's going on with, with the shirts that's on, that's there now, the nine one shirts. Yeah. It's really see, interesting I that the first shirts, I the mean, fashion shirts, was on that ski, was before the skis happened. Now the shirts is now like color now, which is. Yeah. Really crazy I, I experience. I mean, even even with my own now. life creatively as it is now, I can't really make any promises to people while I'm caring for my father because, um, you know, I, he's 98, he has dementia and he needs me. So I, I, I can't really, you know, I, I can't really make any promises to anyone in, in that regard. Yeah. Um, so I have to put my, I have to put my father first. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Of course, from that. You completely understand now. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Or, or say Mischief the Monkey to, to, to your dad to make him feel better. 
<laughs> Mr. The Monkey. Yeah, I think I think yeah, Mr. The Monkey can make people like better or happier of anything. I think there's a legend there in the of making. why you are for making a song. Yeah. Well, anyway, and well, think, think think what he's gonna do for people who grow bananas for a living. He's gonna put the whole banana business like up there. It's gonna be, <laughs> it's yeah. gonna be huge. Um. So yeah. 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 Well, he's a good like, yeah, well, again, thank you so much, Philip, for being a part of the show. It's been an honor. You're very welcome. Been, yeah. Not no, just for four of us, but, but as well as for the whole uh, uh, the fans that, we, that you, they can learn from this episode and more what you've done and all. Uh, and so it's really amazing for people, uh, Will's fans, like, to know more about you, uh, especially on here. So we really appreciate it from that from there. Thank you. I, I appreciate that opportunity. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Love and blessings, Love and blessings mm-hmm. to you all and yep. your family and friends. Yep. Thank you all so much for watching, and we appreciate the support and everything, and especially for this episode. Keep more, keep sus- subscribe, keep watching more videos of this, more episodes for every single every Monday, and um, hope you enjoy and see you all for next episode. Jake's Time Massage Show, and for more later on. Thank you so much for the support, and from all of us to 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 you all. Goodbye for now, and see you all in the next episode. Take care now. Oh, and keep on wiggling and blessings to you all. See ya. God bless you. God bless you. See you next time for another episode of Cheek's Happiness Starter Show. See you again soon. Bye-bye.